started recording this session. Um, and um, while we're waiting, um, just while we're waiting, maybe we start with the icebreaker question and people can chat in this very timely for a Wednesday morning. Um, what is your go-to productivity hack? Feel free to type it in the chat. Coffee, that's a great one. Mugs and headphones, putting all electricities, do not disturb, coffee shop, listen to music, okay. Switching locations with white noise. Yeah, I was gonna say white noise is a big thing for, for coffee shops. I am glad that people are thinking about more generally not, you know, it's a specific software that kind of saves today, although that's also very uh, important. Music coffee shops, that's the vibe. That's the vibe for Wednesday morning. To-do list and blocking times, that's Brooke. Library. Yeah, it's quiet and you feel like you have accountability partners and more studying. Zeke, which one is yours? I'll just say mine. Um... For me, it's uh, kind of drafting either a to-do list or like a priority list might even be better um, or looking at my to-do list and prioritizing that. So once I feel like I have that down and have a, a strategy and a plan, it motivates me to really like focus in and I close the door to my office at home and I get it done. Yeah, I'm glad um, people talk about yeah, Google Calendar, ChatGBT, uh, Notion app. Um, yeah, I'm glad that we're thinking creatively, like anything that kind of helps us reset, help us focus. Um, yeah. Organizing workspace. Yeah, that empowers us also in the to-do list. For me, it's actually like an evening shower that kind of resets my day. And then in the evening, if I need to do work, it gives you a clear mind. So thank you everyone. Um, so with that, we're gonna dive into today's discussions um, on uh, interviews. Um, we are going to talk about effective interview prep. We're gonna talk about um, how to negotiate offers um, and uh, how to use AI tools um, in the interview process. We'll have some a bit of activities. And uh, last but not least, since it's the last one of our six workshops, we're going to talk a little bit about uh, how have you enjoyed the, the process, what we can improve on um, to wrap it up. So, all right. Um, now, a review of the pyramid uh, that we've been building on in the past three weeks and early mornings. We started by career exploration, kind of thinking broadly about uh, what your skills, interests, values align, understanding where the industries or the um, um, the job functions, uh, what the needs are. Um, so kind of ma matching the subjective with the objective. And with that, we'll look at where are the gaps and how we can bridge those gaps um, in, the, in the next year. And how do we verbalize that process through so your story and plan? Uh, we looked at a specific job application package and the presentation material is going to use in the recruiting process, namely the resume, LinkedIn, uh, and cover letter. And we also talked about how to integrate what you find out uh, through informational interviews, aka networking, uh, into those application um, uh, materials uh, and build a stronger case for your um for your story and how you present yourself. And you can see that they integrate into today's materials as well. Um, so today we're gonna talk about interview for in uh, preparation for interviews. I see there's an end um, typo in there uh, and offer negotiations um, when we get to that. 
So likely you receive a letter, um, an email like this. Congratulations, we're excited to move you forward in the interview process. I'm looking to find a time for you to meet you with some members, likely by Zoom first or phone call. Using the links below, pro provide your availability for the next two weeks and we will find a time for you on your top companies and call it Lilic. So this comes forward. Now, question. What do you think that they're trying to find out in the interview process? What are the biggest questions they want to find out? There are two big questions. Can the person do the job and will the person do the job? Right, so you think about the can part encompasses the skills and knowledge uh, of the industry. The will part talks about the motivation, the alignment of your interests and values and expectation as well. Um, so these are the two questions they are trying to answer um, and find out in the interview process. And you, because it's a two-way street, you want to find out about um, this job position yourself as well. So we encourage you to keep this, these two questions in mind while you're preparing your materials. So what are core to this pitch? What are core in answering these two questions? Um, as many of you have seen, um, many of the basic interview questions include, tell me about yourself, why this company, why this role, right? This, um, a lot of these are the, will you do the job part? and strengths and weaknesses, uh, can you do the job? Um, many of the first round interviews include behavior questions, uh, which wa they want you to demonstrate how you problem solve in the past or in the future, deal with the conflicts and collaborate with others, um, or multitask or you know whatever that challenging situation is. And you'll find some of these are self-appraised past experiences, others are situational questions, meaning that what if a client walks in right now and tell you they're not happy with their pricing, right? How do we handle that? So it's past or forward, but but a a case, a, a mini kind of situated behavioral case that you kind of demonstrate your skills. Some of specialized interview questions, depending on your track, are case questions, um, mostly used in consulting. Uh, many of you who are Doing prepare like a pro uh, will know this by now that they give you a specific business case to assess your skills for problem solving um, and analyze the situations, asking clarifying questions about assumptions and proposing a solution. So this is a very structured process to do a case interview. Uh, increasingly in finance, we also see that there are case interviews um, for a company valuation or a M&A sell side pitch. Uh, that includes a modeling um, aspect and the presentation aspect. Um, technical interviews, um, these can be one sentence kind of questions like calculate some formulas for financial uh, for financial information. Data science could be write a query to return a total number of sales in each product and something like that. So it's, it's a more of a one-liner uh, type question for technicals. In marketing, you'll probably have yourselves too. Um, occasionally, we also see group interviews. Uh, this happens probably more in person uh, when there's final rounds. It can be stressful uh, where you try to accommodate to each other and try to work collegially at the same time. You know that each of you are being evaluated for your leadership and kind of originality as well. Um, Brooke and Zeke, do you have any, any other insights into interview questions and the set of situations that students may come across. Yeah, um, I can say from the master of marketing class that just graduated, who's still interviewing, that a few have mentioned to me they have had some group interviews via Zoom, which uh, <laughs> creates a very interesting dynamic. And so I've been getting some just some feedback on how that's been going for them. Um, but it's it can be hard, even harder on, on Zoom um, because you just don't have that body language per se. And so uh, it's just being unafraid to go off mute and, and say what you need to say. And if 
you accidentally interrupt someone, it's apologizing and either letting them go first, then you go, or maybe the other person will let you go. Um, but yeah, I've had that, two students in the last week that have had group interviews via Zoom and they're just like, what is this? Um, so that's, that's good feedback for me to help them prepare for, for the next one. That is that is interesting. Um, I mean, my my impression is group interviews are a bit less common for the the data science students, um, and and for the finance students. Although Jenny may know more on that, um, but it's yeah, it, it's definitely a different different dynamic when that happens. And yeah, just glad. It, definitely a good thing is you have an interview to try to think. Uh, a lot of times you can ask, you know, which of these categories does it fall into, so you know where you're where you're heading. Yeah. Uh and broker, I think you're right in the sense of specific group interviews may not happen. Um, I do find for for finance students, you know, if there's a final day to visit the office and there are other competitors, that whole day or two becomes a group interview setting, um, which um kind of is where you want to look out for because you're constantly being evaluated. Is that sort of a super day type type setup? Yes. Where yes. yeah, yeah, it's a good point. Yeah. Oh, Cece was saying, I also had a group interview before and found it more stressful than normal interview, for sure. There's just a lot of cues that you need to be um, paying attention to. Yeah. I'll, I'll ask for both Ginny and Zeke, when you all, any, any suggestions, general suggestions you have for people going into group interviews um, or any things that you, you feel like you've heard? One of the things I feel like I've encountered is that um, I feel like a lot of Vanderbilt students may be tempted to like, I, I guess I see this more often with our MBA students, but I'll say this here, to go in and be like, oh, if it's a group interview, like I need to establish myself as the leader right away and I need to be the one that's talking the most. And and I tend to find that that may not actually be the necessarily the best approach, um, the, the feeling that you have that you have to lead. But I'd be curious if any of the rest of you have thoughts on that. Yeah, I would agree. Um, I think kind of blind, almost like the blind leadership will kind of put people off, but rather like if you really have good inputs, um, you don't have to be the first one to voice your views or anything. But if it's something that uh, borrows other people's ideas and put and kind of uh, put integrates people's inputs together or bridge conversations, that can be seen as a much more way to be a leader. Yeah, I would agree with that. When I was a recruiter and would host a super day, meaning we invited a bunch of candidates to the company um, and we would have some group interviews. I always kind of took note if any of the interviewees helped facilitate the conversation. I thought that was a, a really unique skill to be able to do in that setting. Um, so I always took note of that and as did many of the hiring managers when they were like, wow, they're actually giving some of their competition an opportunity to to talk or expand on a particular idea. Um, and it just shows, you know, servant leadership, if you will. And it, and it seems like that makes sense too, with a lot of, you know, a lot of the roles that, you know, students from these programs are going into. I mean, they're looking for people who are, are more often going to be a good teammate as opposed to someone who's going to come in and, you know, really lead up a, a team. Um, like that's, that's typically not, not what you're being asked to do. Yeah. Uh, one thing, you know, about super days and, and kind of more elongated interview processes is that you want to be nice to everyone in the office, um, even the janitors, secretaries. Uh, you definitely want to be, be coming across as leaving a good impression overall um, and to treat everyone respectfully. Yeah. Okay. Um, so for behavior questions, um, I think the, the CMC office agrees that this is the this is the part as foundational that you're come, gonna come across in whatever interview settings um, um, that you're preparing for this fall. And it's something that you get a fully, full kind of access, uh, um, fully accessible to you before even any technical parts kicks in. So we strongly recommend that you have these prepared um, in your pocket, um, and be ready to deliver because um, this is something you have 100% um, control over. 
so we usually use a star um, structure to, to deliver behavioral questions, and this is our recommendation anyway. Uh, the star stands for situation, task, uh, action, and results. And on the right, you can see it's a recommended approach of how you unpack these um, a situation. Uh, and the majority of the time you can see should be focused on your actions because the recruiters probably don't care about what specific situation that you come across. Is the, the what matter is is what you did to those situations, right? So they are focused on how you solve the problems, what was involved in the execution, uh, what options. Um, you considered and also like if you did something, what went wrong and how do you come back and resolve it further? There's a lot of um, um, action items that they actually are looking for in that answers. Um, a common mistake that we see students um, make is to talk a whole lot about a situation and task, how challenging it was, but like, well, I just went in and did it, right? Like it's very hard for us to articulate and being aware of all the, hoops that we jumped through and how we did our things. And because we don't need to, we don't usually want to brag anyway, but this is where you do want to be confident and articulate clearly the steps that you took to solve the situation. Another common mistake is that we use, again, we don't want to brag, so we use a lot of we. We did this, we did that. No, this is a setting where your individual responsibility, your approach that made a difference. Um, so pay attention to using some of the eyes and then articulate your actions. And the result part um, can be tricky sometimes. We also recommend that you quantify the result if that's possible, whether you got a, a group project that's um, aced a whole course or whether you, you got some senior management using the group's report or um, your particular products, those can be helpful um, instead of, oh, and then we just did it and the situation went away. Um, so um, pay attention to articulate some of those results as well. Now you can see how these star situations can actually um, project to your resume items quite well. When we're talking about resumes, we talk about, okay, tell us specifically about your responsibilities and if we can quantify some of the results, that would be the best. So this is also, part where you can expand on like one sub bullet in your resume and make your personality and your whole profile shine more. Any questions on the star construct? Any thoughts, Baruch and Zeke? Um, I mean, I'll say definitely a good thing to be familiar with because pretty much, you know, everybody on the previous slide, there are these different types of interviews that some of you may or may not see. Almost everybody is gonna get behavioral interviews. You probably have gotten them already. Um, I'll say when I do mock interviews, I feel like the thing that I see most common is um, is forgetting the results. People forget to, you know, they'll kind of, I did this, 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 and then they'll forget that quick wrap of, of, you know, and this is what happened afterwards, or I presented and then, you know, the leadership decided to do that. So don't don't forget that part. Yeah, I would agree. I I know with the uh, marks I've been meeting so far, I've already kind of planted the seed in my first conversation to start thinking of of these stories. They're so important because you can even use them outside of an interview for when you network. You might do a more condensed version of a key accomplishment or something that you've done that you know made you interested in a, in a particular function or a particular industry so this framework can can really work in a lot of different settings even outside an interview and I've, I've noticed it a lot with networking yeah for sure um and within your preparation you want to kind of mix up the stories as well you don't want to refer every star story back to that one internship you had two summers ago right so you want to present a, a portfolio of different aspects of your life or professional and academic life. Um, so mix it up. Um, this is a time to kind of be able to selectively deliver this, the kind of stories that you want to deliver uh, for a particular setting. Um, so now we have a lot of AI tools that proliferate in the last, I would say two years maybe, uh, and we can't summarize all of them out there. Some of you may have your preferences already. Um, a couple um, that we have been found useful 
here I will, will introduce uh, one is Yugli. It is um, a uh, communications coach uh, and it does interview preps by recording yourself on the inter uh, on the screen as well. So it's a really good prep for you to deliver, especially in the Zoom format. Uh, so it really prepares well for higher views and Zoom meetings. Uh, and it's I think it has a free version. Uh, feel free to check it out. Um, also interview warm up that is a new venture by Google. Um, and it has similar kind of prompts and setups to kind of lead you to a set of in interview questions by the function and the uh, level experiences you have. Another one um, is interview is the LinkedIn interview database. Um, so these ones you can see that you can um, they're common questions uh, and and there's the categories. This is a categories one that has a lot of them. Like if there's accounting, if there's a business analyst, a marketing manager, a software engineer, what have you. So these are kind of the basic set of um, common questions. And you can click on this practice and get feedback link and then see many, many people have done that. The, the TMA has been practiced by 17 million people. Uh, and get instant feedback from LinkedIn. So all of these are, are um, free resources just to get you started. Now, how do we use AI tools? Um, we can use them to practice interviews as we just discussed. We can also use them to, uh, to conduct, conduct background research. Like you've got a ad hoc interview with some company uh, that you just started to get into to know. Uh, feel free to use ChatGPT and AI tools uh, to conduct um, basic research about them. Um, and if you're not using the latest um, ChatGPT, um, keep in mind that the information may be dated. So try again like that with you know, a general Google news search. Um, it can help you generate potential interview questions, even if it's not the video and interactive ones. Like ChatGPT, they can help you generate potential interview questions and brainstorm for answers with you. Um, you can also ask follow-up questions in response to the prompts responses. So kind of in a, in a verbal format uh, with, uh, with ChatGPT, they can also do that for you, um, if other, not other tools already. You can they can evaluate your proposed answers, whether that's too verbose, whether you should you know uh, highlight your or um, analytical skills more in your answers, um, and they can kind of help you see where is the match in between again your skills, interest, and values with the companies, right? So to the extent they can provide that, and that's going to be very very helpful feedback for you. Uh, now do avoid sounding scripted by AI. Uh, we've had this in the last couple of years, I believe, and especially in Zoom interviews, people can tell if you're reading from a screen and if it's you're being robotic and it's not really your own words. So you can use AI tools uh, to come with first draft, but really um, make it your personal story uh, by practicing, by changing up the words, by the, the, the last kind of fine tunes um, to be conducted by yourself. Now we do have a proprietary interview database at Owen that's on 1220. So if you look, go into research tools and we'll have an interview database, um, we should be opening that soon, uh, if not already, um, by, by early August, at least that should be available to you all, if not, if not right now. Um, there you can search for the consult the functions uh, and employers, I believe, um, and um, the past interview questions that our students have locked in. Um, so these are actual questions that's been asked. Any questions or comments on this section? Um, Jenny, I'll say that also um, in the interview database, I've noticed some students will offer some key insights to an interview process. Um, so for example, there was a few students this spring that were interviewing with um, a company named Epsilon, which is uh, like a agency slash consulting firm. Um, and they were just talking about the different rounds and 
kind of who they met with each round. Uh, so I thought that was just interesting insight for, for students to be able to better prepare for those conversations. Yeah, and I, I see that popped up there. So. Yeah, yeah, indeed. Um, while it's not necessarily consistent across employers, some students do provide a really great insight and feedback um, on the firms that they interviewed with. So yeah, thank you, Z. Now, um, interviews can be stressful and nerve wracking sometimes, and especially you're juggling among academic requirements and sometimes traveling to the destination, the logistics and everything. Um, so how to build interview confidence? Um, question for y'all, do y'all know what's the number one fear of Americans? Type in the chat if you want to. Yes, yes. By far, public speaking. Um, and a uh, a way, the number one way to address public speaking fear is by pre preparation and practice, right? So when this is when you get to a stage where you know the materials so much more than the audience that you can deliver, and there'll be almost no questions that can kind of make you um, kind of doubt your answers. And so that, that's where preparation and practice is really important in building interview um, confidence as well. Because after all, you are addressing um, an audience, even though it's, it's most likely one-on-one. -on -one. Um, so by preparation, you research the company and the role very well, hopefully with networking, hopefully with AI tools. Um, and by finding um, public sources um, and library sources, for example. Um, so the research part is very important. Now here, what we, what we see is on top of that, you need to be uh, very specific when showing your knowledge. Now, what does that mean? It means that once you have done a lot of research, you have so many data points, right? And then you your mind probably get, starts to aggregate those data and worked out, for example, it's so typical for like, oh, I love your company's culture, right? So that's a generalization that you come after you've done all the research, whereas the other side, they wanna hear what's specific about our culture that you have learned. So dive, dive into those stories. Oh, I heard this VP said, every deal team has four people, so there's clarity of responsibility. Um, people really don't mind helping each other when there are multiple deals coming at the same time, right? Give them specifics that you know about them because this is where all your research needs to shine. So don't aggregate and generalize those data, give them specifics. This can come out in um, your cover letter as well, right? So that first paragraph where we hopefully have personalized um, messages um, instead of saying like, we love the company's um, meritocracy culture, we can talk more specifics about what in those culture that, that differentiates them from others. Um, it's also important to prepare for the logistics of the day. And this can be a huge uh, anxiety point for a lot of people if those are not sorted out. Um, so prepare early and get um, those in sequence. Um, we find the most important part of preparing the interview answers to be with peers, um, with your classmates, alumni mentors, and some just with family. Like get your dad or sister on a call to practice. Um, like anyone that kind of help you with the delivery. You want to be prepared for your personal pitch. That's your teammate. You want to be prepared for star stories, um, and acknowledge the fact that the fact that some interviews will become your practice runs because it's very unlikely that I'm gonna ace every single one of them. Um, this is important because we don't know where the job market will be. Um, so you don't want to wait too much time before your before you know the market opens up and then your dream company asks for an interview and that becomes your first interview. You don't want that to happen. You want to have a few um prep runs um, in done and kind of warmed up and knowing what that dynamic can look like 
before you get to your dream interviews uh, with your dream employers. Also remember this is a two-way street, right? So if an interview feels like interrogation, that's not a great dynamic for anyone. So how do you remember we were talking about the questions? Can the person do the job? Will the person do the job? You want to find that out like about um for yourself as well, right? You don't want to ace the interview but not being able to perform or don't really like that environment. So you, it's a two-way street. You want to find out uh, things about them as well. So that means having an agenda for yourself. What are the questions that you want to ask? Like how do you perceive the organizational culture or dynamics? Um, and also you want to showcase yourself. This again, not an interrogation. You want to say, these are the things that I can offer. So that's what I mean by having an agenda to yourself. And you can have a portfolio of star stories where you showcase different side of you in the kind of job skill sets that they require. And that I feel can change that dynamic between you being like react being reactive to the questions that are being asked. Does that make sense? But still, anxiety will show up. Um, who has watched Inside Out too? I have. I loved it. Yeah, we'll see people visit. Definitely check it out. Yeah, someone, Nicole saw it. Other people wanted to see it. Um, why I'm showing this picture is anxiety shows up. I think this was, it's not a spoiler because the trailer already sees it, already says it. He shows up prepared, right? With all these suitcases and everything. He's prepared. So anxiety is there to help us, right? You want to kind of contain the, the anxiety but it, it can be productive. New bad boys. Oh, I'm gonna check that out. Now, anxiety is not bad for you. There is a psychological um, law, which is called your, your kiss and Dawson. It's a bell curve of how your arousal level can affect your performance. So here in the middle, there's an optimal arousal level Right, that's anxiety um, approximation. Now, if you are less aroused or kind of being kind of feeling numb or like uninterested, then you need to increase the increasing attention and in your interest. Now, if there's too much arousal, then that impairs your performance, right? Now, there's an optimal level of arousal, so pay attention to the physical state that you're in leading up to the interview. This means that if it's someone who's just generally on this side, you want to kind of active in the, like me, I introvert, you want to active your social mode. And that can be doing, I don't know, push-ups or like squats or kind of activate your physiological state to get you into an activated mode. For other people, if you're on this side, um, um, over anxiety, you may want to calm your nerves down by deep breathing, meditation, meditation and visualization exercises before um, the interview so that you get into this optimal range. Um, another very powerful, what we call reframing tool is, is it stress, anxiety, or is it excitement? <clears throat> I think many of us are <clears throat> excited to meet a new people representatives of the new company that you want to work for, right? So how reappraisal leads to better performance is very strong as well. Uh, this HBS research, you can click on it and see it. It's, it's almost like a, a, a literature review or, or, or summary of um, the, the, the effect of reframing stress as excitement. So compared with those people who attempt to just calm down, right, calm down, people who actually reappraise their anxious arousal as excitement feels more excited and perform better. Right, so this is a this is a cognitive reframing effect as well. So yeah, anxiety is gonna be there. Um, you're just gonna get it to the right level and you know, it's excitement anyway. So hopefully this can help. 
All right. Now we're a bit over half the time. We're going to have an interview prep activity and you're gonna pair up um, and talk about the interview question you struggle with the most. Now, this gives the other person also an opportunity to understand what questions can be tricky and uh, we can all struggle. Uh, take a minute to gather your thoughts, whether it's a STAR framework or not, uh, and take turns to interview each other and provide feedback. We'll give you um, eight minutes, if that's okay. I am going to pair people up into breakout rooms. Room one has three people. All right. Yeah, there we go. I just um dropped it in chat. I those should be links for the um the different tools that you mentioned. And I think I was I was looking on 1220. I think you all will be getting access to the um, interview database within 1220. Um, I think at the start of August is when, um, around the start of classes is when access to that opens up. Um, although if you are interviewing and you wanna enter your own interview questions, you can, you can do that now it looks like, or help build the database. Yeah. Um, Jenny, we had a question in our group about the AI tools actually. Yeah. Did you, did you mean that we could use the AI tools in preparation for interviews or actually during the interview? Because we've we've seen it both ways uh, and we know that it's possible, but yeah. <laughs> I've not seen it live in action, um, but I welcome other people's inputs. Um, for the ones that are, have been using it live in action, I, I haven't really heard of very successful yeah. stories because it's, it's hard because they are basic answers that ge generalized answers that are not personalized. Right. So it would, it's unlikely that will, you know, become a better version than your personalized version. Yeah. We thought the same thing. We were just confused. Yeah. <laughs> Thank yeah. you. Yeah. I'll, and that's a, sorry. Oh, I mean, I'll, I'll hop in. I know the one I know of is like, I know you Lee, um, if you're having a meeting, I think you can have Udly sort of record and then offer feedback on the interview or meeting. I think I would definitely be careful with using, I think, I think anytime you're interviewing, I would definitely be careful with that because um, the interviewer may, I mean, some companies really don't want things being recorded or they don't want the questions that you're being asked being like shared publicly. Um, so I would in that situation. But if you're doing a mock interview and I think you'd be like, hey, is it okay if we record this and I get some AI input? Um, I think that setting would be would be helpful. So if that if that relates to, to what you're talking to, some some quick thoughts there. Yes, thank you. Any other questions before we move on to offer negotiation? Um offer negotiation and decisions and hopefully this is a happy topic and negotiation is so um case such case by case and individual uh individual situation so we definitely welcome you come to cmc uh and talk about uh, your situation um uh, about competing offers and negotiation and whatnot because it's very individualized again differs by the industry and your situation right um largely now Three big questions, how and when do I prepare for negotiation? Um, what do I negotiate and when do I negotiate? Um, now, a kind of guideline approach is you don't negotiate until they commit to you um, and whether that's verbalized or written offer. Um, and this is probably is important for international students who uh, can work on three-year OPT, but will prefer sponsorship. And uh, we usually um, recommend the approach to get them get them to buy in your profile, right? Like make sure that you're a strong candidate that they have fully committed to you um, before you start negotiating uh, your negotiation. Now that's per probably particularly true in this kind of job environment where uh, companies have um, 
a lot of bargaining power due to the supply and demand of talents. Uh, what do I negotiate? And some people are focused on the salary. Um, usually, I think where our approach is maybe five to ten percent of the salary uh, range is acceptable. Where you, it, it's in this market, it's hard to go much beyond that. Um, is 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 my gut feel. Uh, other markets that may that may change, right? That kind of reflects what where the economic environment environment that we are in. But uh, negotiation goes much beyond that. So. Uh, for a lot of entry level jobs, there may or may not be a signing bonus, a moving stipend. Um, if nothing can be done in this environment in this first year, because you know you haven't really performed on the job, right? All you had is three, four interviews. Um, you can talk about promotion and where career trajectory is. Like, what is that track that you're looking at? International students, whether it's a visa sponsorship um, for H1B or um, green card. Um, and for large, larger corporations, whether that's in-house mobility um, in the future. Now, the mobility part, you don't want to signal that too early because that, they may take it as like you don't want to work in their office, but maybe something like, you know, in three, four years in the future, you can perform other, you know, other regions or um, product groups or departments that I explore. Um, so use that um, with caution. Uh, negotiation when um, it is the best uh, when you have a competing offer, and we'll talk about leverage in that. Now, if you don't have it, then your leverage is probably much less, but you can still talk about all these um, other um, the, the points above about what you need to negotiate on. So what happens usually is that uh, you interview and then there are the timelines of the different interviews. Sometimes they don't align. Um, now, when you're close to a first offer while you're interviewing with other employers, it may, it may be time to signal to um, the your, your, your kind of preferred employer that you're in other timelines that may be finalizing soon. Um, this is just informational. You're not trying to ask them now. If you do get to get to your first offer, this is where you find out about the package and the deadlines. This is where you do want to inform your top choice and ask for uh, potentially acceleration of their process. Um, and depending on whether that timeline matches, uh, you may or may not need to ask for the, your first offered employer for extension of the timeline. Uh, we just ran into a situation last week where the um the other employer so kind of a second choice um the timeline was an offer by friday morning and they want a um, decision by monday and thankfully that student came to cmc and we advised them that it's highly unusual in the market practice and so we brain uh brainstorm ways to kind of gently ask for extensions um and they can use uh, the reference point and saying that this is CMC's recommendation rather than them having to push back on the other employer themselves. So, because CMC can provide you with the, what's the market standard, what is the general practice these days. So maybe there's less pressure on the students um, themselves. Um, now, if they don't give an extension or if the first um, your first choice doesn't really accelerate, this is where you repeat the whole process for your next. Um, best choice. There's a lot of moving parts here. So again, come to CMC. This would be a happy situation uh, to be resolving for um, when your individual situation arises. Um, again, some of the salary databases that we have, um, research tools under 1220, um, their salary database, um, there is also the class employment report that you guys have access to. Now, these are all um, internal. External, uh, there is a Bureau of Labor Statistics, um, which provides a occupational outlook handbook. It's very comprehensive um, data database, but it's also across geographies. So, you know, there is cost of living um, standards that's, that needs to be adjusted. Um, H-1B uh, salary database um, for international students. Uh, and also you have Glassdoor um, and other tools online these days for um, salary data. Now, we've talked a lot 
uh, about interviews today um, and negotiation offers. Uh, so take home messages are prepare ahead of time um, to go, that will build confidence. Uh, you want to be at least proficient in your star stories and team A this summer. Um, take advantage of peer resources and AI tools in your in your preparation process as that gets you the feedback that you don't see by yourselves. Hopefully you've made some friends today. Um, feel free to reach out to each other for that peer resource going on uh, even before you hit the ground in August. Um, and again, no offer negotiate can have multiple facets and should be considered on an individual cases. And um, come to us when that happens uh, and we'll help you navigate through. So this is the end. Um, you've all done it. Um, thank you for joining us in this past six sessions in three weeks. Um, so this is your summer prep journey. Uh, we started with exploration uh, and planning. Uh, we talked about connection uh, and, uh, and succeeding today. Um, and this is a sort of a complete career exploration, career development journey. And hope, we hope that you take it with you in the school year ahead and also in uh, your uh, career, your full career ahead of you. Um, so we would say that even if you're thinking about pivoting to other careers, this will be helpful for you uh, as a framework. Uh, so definitely feel free to uh, take advantage of it uh, throughout your professional career. I want to thank everyone for being part of this journey. Um, and maybe we can use the next five minutes to take people's feedbacks on what you enjoy, what you didn't enjoy, what was missing, um, and do you feel prepared uh, heading into the program? Um, and what do you want to change for next year? It's a lot of questions. We'll come back to this and we'll stop the recording.